Welcome to the Saturday Night Live After Party. This week, we'll be discussing Season 47, Episode 13 of SNL with host John Mulaney and musical guest LCD Sound System. I'm John Murray, and I'm joined this week by fellow Canadian truck protest holdovers, Steve Finn, and first-time panelist, Casey Lyons. If you'd like to connect with Casey, you can find him on Instagram, at Casey, with an E, Lyons, with a Y, S-Y-N-W. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us exclusively on Truth Social, at SNL Podcast. All right, enjoy. Steve Finn, as I live and breathe. John Murray, look at it you. It has been uh, way too long. It has been. It's great to see you. And it looks like you're back in your natural habitat. I am. Well, I've been home for a while. It got pretty cold out there in the forest. So <laughs> I've, uh, I, I'm back in my home studio slash garage. If only you could see what is behind that backdrop. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm here for the next few months. Then I'm going to be heading up to your neck of the woods. But that's a conversation for another time. Um, yes. What I really want to know is uh, who's this uh, bloke that uh, you brought along to chat SNL? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Uh, this is my good friend, Casey Lyons, who Hi, I miss Casey. dearly. Hello. <laughs> Hello, <Joe>. Hello, Casey. <laughs> Hello, you lovely man. It's, yes, uh, I... it's an honor to be here. Yes, yeah. man. It's great to see you. Uh, I know Casey from back in Toronto. Uh, you know, uh, when I lived there, Casey and I, we uh, played in some bands. We were, we were musicians and uh, yeah, we were kind of on the same circuit. And Casey, you know, I always loved running into you and seeing you because, like, at that time in my life, I had no friends that were into SNL at all. So I'd be like, oh, finally, Casey is a mega fan like me. And so I would always just, like, run to him whenever we'd be, like, at Rancho Relaxo, where Casey used to serve me drinks. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd be like, man, what do you think of this? What do you think of Leslie Jones? And, you know, this is, you know, this was at the time when we were hanging out, like, that era. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't Casey, think I've had more conversations. Here. I don't think I've had more conversations about Leslie Jones with anyone than I have with you. <laughs> uh, um, that she she was one who, oh my god, she fully won me over. Yeah. So uh, you know, you have a uh, a career trajectory that has taken you through some uh, some comedy circuits in Toronto. Uh, why don't you give us some of your more recent creds on the, on the comedy scene? Uh, oh, Lord. Well, I've been out of uh, the comedy scene in any sort of meaningful way beyond my my day job, which is working for the Second City, which is, I guess, very fully entrenched in uh, in comedy. Uh, but the last thing I did... <laughs> yeah, that's not nothing. <laughs> no, it, not it's, nothing. it's definitely something. Um, but I guess the last thing I did creatively uh, was I wrote a piece of music for... Um, Mark Forward, he was, uh, uh, he's doing a, a, I can't even remember, it's a spot on a show, it's upcoming, but uh, I wish I had more, I wish I was better at plugging, but uh, yeah, that's sort of the last <laughs> thing I've been doing creatively or anywhere near the uh, comedy scene. Okay. Now, I want to, I want to fill the audience in on a little bit of backstory here, because it's, it's very fortuitous that, that this is happening tonight. Um. I've known Steve for a while, obviously, because he's been a mainstay on the show since the beginning. So we've been doing this for over five years. Um, but I crossed paths with you, Casey, on a totally different project unrelated to this. I had no idea that you had any affiliation with Steve. And it was just um, when I was looking up your your info uh, to make some show notes or something for the other project that you and I were involved in that I noticed that you were friends with Steve on Facebook. And I thought, right. well, you know, that's you know, that's just the most random thing ever. So I asked Steve and he's like, yeah, I was totally going to do an SNL podcast with that dude before you asked me. And I thought, <laughs> isn't that just the the weirdest thing? They say Canada's <laughs> a small place. And I, I feel like we are living up to that reputation. And uh, I think I think it's going to be fun. This is there's going to be an appropriate level of Canadian representation. Uh, it's a bit of a dude fest, but I'm OK with that. Uh, <laughs> sooner or later, Catherine can come back and uh, take the reins again. But for tonight, we're going to do it old school. We're going to do it our way. And uh, uh, I'm really just looking forward to breaking down what I th I think was a pretty fun episode to not give away the ending. And um, I I'm ready to jump in. But there's one thing that we have to take care of before we 
get into the episode proper. We have to establish your SNL cred. So I'm going to ask you a couple very lightweight SNL questions. And as long as you don't totally wet the bed on them, we'll, we'll proceed with the episode review. So, uh, first off your era, when did you start watching SNL? Like what got you into it? What is your SNL origin story? Uh, my SNL origin story, I guess I really started paying attention. Um, around 89 probably uh my it's funny my cast who my cast is really really changes like i mean my my first cast you know dana um dana carvey uh uh, kevin nealon this is just when when dana carvey was right new so you know uh kevin Mm nealon um john lovitz it was uh going into the really super inspired uh, era of um, of SNL. So that was when I jumped on board and I was young enough to be, I mean, Dana Carvey was like, oh, I'll just go ahead and be him for the rest of my life. That's that's my <laughs> my ultimate goal. Uh, and but then, you know, you, you go on and Mike Myers shows up and and then you get into like the Sandler years and stuff like that. But that's I, I think in my heart, it's Jan Hooks and and like Nora Dunn and and Lovitz and, and Dana Carvey and uh, Neil and them. Wow. OK, Great yeah, era. you go you go back quite a ways. Yeah, we've got your era, but who are your luminaries? Like who are the the touchstone, the like the top three players in all of SNL history that you think define the show for you and are like your go-to people. Top three is cruel, uh, but <laughs> isn't uh, it though? <laughs> it absolutely is. Um, but uh, of course, I, I go uh, Dana Carvey. Um, sure. Hell, this might actually be easier than I thought. Uh, yeah, Dana Carvey, Phil Hartman, and. God, I want to say Farley. I really, I'll go say, I'll go ahead and say Farley. Yeah. Okay. That's respectable. That's respectable. Last question. We've got your era. We've got your luminaries, but if you were going to be objective, what would you say is the, the best, most quintessential, just the, the peak of SNL? Uh, era wise, like a, a run of seasons when the show was at its best. Has there ever been a run of seasons <laughs> where it was at its best? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I want to say consistently f- from because, you know, at, at the beginning of the Carvey, Nealon kind of era, they were just shaking off the the tra- the grossness that was the 80s. Right um right, right so so they're 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 fresh and they're anew and they go from like it's a star making machine at this point right like so and that the definition of what saturday night live is i think is uh, uh exemplified perfectly between like 89 and about 93 when okay. when was the right around when Dana Carvey times? left? Yeah, kind of. Well, th- about uh, ninety five is when it it really really kind of tanked and was you know there's a lot of drama around the show. It, and and that was when yeah that was when it might as well have been like the eighties again. It was uh, just kind of corporate yeah. and gross. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it def- definitely goes in waves. Absolutely. Okay, so Steve, uh, what do we think? Uh, can we can we roll on here? Has Casey passed the test? I think he, yes, he gets a passing letter grade that we will keep confidential. Uh, you know, <laughs> will I receive that? Will be mail filed. Or? Uh, yes, yes, and there will be a refresher exam in six months, so uh, we're good for that amount of time. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm. I'm in agreement. I think we are good to roll on here. Before we jump into the show proper, though, I just want to give a shout out to one of our newest patrons, Amanda Mills from Bellingham, Washington. Uh, obviously, we love our patrons. The show wouldn't exist without them. And anytime someone's willing to chip in, I I want to do everything I can to give them an attaboy. And so, thank you, Amanda Mills. And with that said, you guys ready to roll into the show? Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. For the cold open, in a solemn turn, the Ukrainian chorus Dumka of New York performed Prayer for Ukraine. So this obviously is not our typical cold open. This is something the show does every now and again when it feels that it's warranted. Um, Steve, I'll, I'll throw to you first because this is kind of a loaded question. 
Um, do you feel like this was one of the occasions when a solemn cold open was needed? Or do you think we're doing this more often now in this modern era? How did this land for you? Do you feel like this is what you wanted to see to kick off the show? Oh, I guess you're asking me if like the bar is lowering for meriting uh, something like this and putting the comedy aside in a comedy variety show. That's kind of what I'm saying is like, is, yeah. is, is this necessary in this situation? And as often as they're going back to this sort of uh, alternate cold open now. <laughs> that is super loaded. Yep. That's why I didn't throw the case. <laughs> I got to ease him into the bath slowly here. <laughs> That is uh, more loaded than the lethal aid that Ukraine is currently receiving. Uh, <laughs> but I will, I will say that uh, I, honestly, it didn't cross my mind. So I guess for me, it, uh, it hasn't gotten there yet. Okay. Uh, geez, I just, I think it is appropriate to uh, to acknowledge with with how sh- strong it is going on and. And you know, with all the conversation going around about it, and and the president staying in the in the country, and uh, you know, the talk of it, you know, being the start of World War Three, people are kind of a little bit scared about it. So, mm-hmm. I, I think it it merits uh, a piece. Uh, yeah. So maybe a typical cold open. Uh, I think we got to let it slide that it was it was done away with. I think. I think this is the appropriate move. Okay. All right, Casey. So now that I've let Steve sort of flail in the, the breeze here for a couple minutes, um, do you have any brilliant thoughts on how this landed for you? Do you feel like they struck the right tone? What was your takeaway on this? Uh, I, I honestly, I, I really, uh, I really dug it. Uh, I, I like it when, when SNL gets a little bit somber and stands up for something. I mean, you know, we talk, we have that conversation a lot about Saturday Night Live's political influence in the United States. Uh, and for whatever it means and for whatever it is, for them to throw their weight behind the Ukraine is, I think, a nice gesture. And it's a nice gesture that, you know, us, the diehard fans, uh, appreciate. I, I know I do. I, I, I like yeah, knowing that, sure. that an institution that brings me so much comfort and, uh, and that normalizes my my week and my life in general. I like to know that they stand up for the things that I believe in. Yep. Very good. Yep. Um, I wish I had something as as moving to say about it as you do, Casey. Um, I really don't. And I don't have a good answer to my question. And that's actually why I posed it, because <laughs> I I don't know where I, I land on it because it, it came up and it occurred to me as as you know, they fade in and there's no like laughter or title card for a sketch or anything like that. Um that I wasn't expecting it. It wasn't a week where it occurred to me that, oh, they're going to have to do something serious because this is just such a tragedy or this is such a a situation that it has to be commented on. Nobody's going to accept laughing with SNL if they don't uh, address this first. I was, it, it just didn't occur to me that they would need to do it for this. So maybe I've, I'm just out of touch with maybe how the world's actually feeling about this. Um, I will admit that I've been on a bit of like a, a culture detox since new year's, just like trying to not get as wrapped up and invested in just all the crazy that's going on in the world right now. So, um, I'll be the first to admit that just maybe because I'm keeping all that stuff at a bit of a distance, maybe I'm not as, as, uh, invested in what's happening in Ukraine as, as other people. But, um, obviously what they came up with always feels like, I don't want to say cool. That's the wrong word, but it feels like it was thoughtful. Like someone at the show said, like, how can we, you know, give some dignity and respite and just a little bit of just hopefully good vibes to the mm-hmm. the people of Ukraine. And, uh, I obviously, I, I couldn't have thought of anything better to do if that's what you want to do with it. So I feel like what they came up with was appropriately solemn and that yeah. it, it felt like this was going to feel important to Ukrainians that understand that prayer for Ukraine like that, that to them is uh, it's a very well-known hymn. It's something that's used a lot in patriotic ceremonies. It's something that is, uh, it, it's like an anthem for them. It's not their national anthem per se, but it, it's something that a lot of people would would hear that and it'd probably bring a tear to their eye right now. And so I think that that's very um It was beautiful, sweet, And too. I think sincere. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was very beautiful. It was a beautiful, beautiful. rendition. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was a good move to let 
the music do 99% of the talking. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, with everybody out there with a bunch of different opinions on what's going on, it's probably best to leave words <laughs> off the page and just yeah, yeah. let this song say what needs to be said for each person watching. Let yeah. them extrapolate from from this what what they want it to basically right yeah yeah so for 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 all those reasons like for what it was i feel like it came off as very sincere and very affecting and so i think it worked and i think it would especially work for someone who's uh really heavily invested in what's happening in ukraine especially you know the ukrainian population or the ukrainian american population that might be tuning in uh, I feel like this was something for them and I feel like it probably was very moving. And so for all those reasons, I got to give it a win. Uh, I just wish I had a better beat on how I feel in the, the, the grander scheme of things about SNL going back to the, the solemn cold open. Now it might just be that there's more things happening in the world that warrant it. I don't know. I don't have a good answer. It just, it just caught me off guard that that's the direction they went. That said, sounds like we're all in agreement that, uh, it was a, a worthwhile way to kick off the show. Yep. Beautiful. So let's keep uh, moving along here. Let's take a look at the monologue. John Mulaney turned an innocent man into a drug dealer. Okay, Casey, <laughs> uh, a little bit of fresh stand up from John Mulaney after a tumultuous year. Uh, what'd you think of this? I I am uh, an absolute sucker for John Mulaney stand up. He is a genius at the craft. And this was, and I've I've heard him deliver uh, sets that I liked less than other sets, where I was like, he sounds overworked, and I'm just being an insufferable gatekeeper about it, honestly. <laughs> but uh, because he's always funny, uh, and but tonight or, or last night, man, it, it it felt like a bit of a return to form. It felt like there was uh, the energy that I remember seeing. Uh, or, or you know, hearing in New in Town, and uh, uh, I, I, I loved it. I thought it was it. It hit all the right notes. It hit all the. It, it answered all the questions that needed to be answered, and it said, "I'm not going to answer some other questions that I don't want to answer," <laughs> which is nice. I think. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's a pretty good take on it. What do you think, Steve? Uh, How did this land for you? Uh, Led it pretty well, and I. Th- uh, I found, I think what Casey was alluding to, uh, I found this interesting about it is, you know, what he was willing to uh, reflect from his personal life in this uh, new era of his career post rehab mm-hmm. and, and what he chose to kind of skip past, uh, you know, without much mentioning of his uh, divorce, for example, we simply get a reference to my girlfriend just had a baby. Yeah. We get, we, we kind of cut to that chase. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I know that he has been doing material on his, uh, intervention. Uh, some of this stuff he's been working on in the late night circuits for, uh, for the past recent while. And, uh, yeah, as far as it goes, it was, yeah, classic Mulaney, but also, uh, very different in the sense that his personal life looks very much different. And when you're a comedian that draws so much from your personal life for, uh, for your material, uh, you know, (laughs) that's a big rocking of the boat, if you will. Mm -hmm. So for him to go out there and did what he did in an attempt to rebuild it, uh, to, you know, view his, his life through this new lens, I think it was, pretty successful and i loved it that that story that he told about the the person he turned into a drug dealer is such a john (laughs) mulaney way of looking at the world Mm -hmm. this is exactly the kind of stuff that i expect from him the kind of quality at least yep yeah so needless to say i give it thumbs up yeah yeah that was the moment where i said oh yeah there it is you know that's that's the caliber of uh, taking his anecdote, distilling it down into a clever notion and just delivering it with gusto. Like that was the moment where I said, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is Mulaney uh, in, in 
not not rare form. This is a millennium good form. Like I, the big question that I had going into this is, you know, you have a heck of a year. Are you just kind of like learning to walk again, or have you already kind of got up to speed? And I think he walked out and didn't miss a beat and delivered flawless material that was on par with everything we've seen from him uh, previously. And like you said, Casey, it didn't seem like he was just sort of like burnt out and, uh, you know, phoning it in. Like there was nothing about that. It, he, he had a good energy and he was communicating the idea that like, look guys, I'm in a better place. You know, that's, that's all we really need to take away from this is, um, anyone that loves SNL and, and loves John Mulaney knows that he's had some, some, uh, some drama the last year or so. And so I think a lot of people just wanted to know is, is he looking healthy? Is he looking energized? Does it look like he's on an upswing in life? And, uh, I bought into it. I felt like he was, and that, that just gave me the confidence that, okay, good, great. We didn't, we didn't lose anything with John Mulaney. Like we're never going to get old John Mulaney back. He's, you know, he's found his footing. This is great. We're, we're going to be in for a good show. Uh, it said all that to me. That's what I wanted to see. And, you know, as always just happy to see anyone that's been through some adversity regain their footing. We, I'm sure everybody knows someone with addiction issues in their life and you're always rooting for them. And when you get a victory like that and you, you see someone that's on an upswing, you gotta, you just gotta be happy. So I was happy. I couldn't right. agree more. Moving right along. Our first live sketch of the night. Tango, the monkey judge presides <laughs> over a monkey attack trial. <laughs> All right, Casey, as someone who uh, cut their teeth in the era of unfrozen caveman lawyer, I'm, I'm going to let you uh, break this one down. And obviously that is that's very much the uh, like the touch point that comes to mind, like from the costuming on mm -hmm. down. Uh, and and like he, he really does borrow so much from Phil Hartman for this, because the thing that makes this successful and. Damn it, this was successful uh, uh, for me. Um, the thing that makes it successful is his ability to skirt the line between being a no-nonsense judge uh, and, and using <laughs> like a, a very like a, a very no-nonsense cadence, but also saying monkey things, saying monkey things <laughs> uh, in a monkey way, but still maintaining that authority in his voice. It's beautiful. It's beautifully performed comedy. It was a great yeah. example of it. That's yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. How about you, Steve? What's your takeaway? Yeah. It's uh, a brilliant sketch and yeah, uh, I don't take any points away from it for being so comparable to the Phil Hartman character. Uh, yes. It's, it's quite similar in the sense that you're taking, you know, the sophistication, the very deliberate language used in the courtroom uh, and having this monkey character acknowledge and uh you know actually speak about his own uh feral ways <laughs> yes. it's it's brilliant you know he it, it's just a, an impossibility that can only exist in a fictional sketch that asks you not to take it seriously mm -hmm. uh it's uh yeah it's just uh Brilliant. And and the fact that they use these props in the way and the, the very <laughs> randomness of the uh you know the uh the paper, the shredded paper and the cake going on it, it's all very <laughs> <laughs> it's all very like subtly chaotic, just like it is dealing with a monkey and, and trying to I guess socialize with it. Mm. Uh yeah, and, and it just kept on going. Uh Cecily entering the mix was a perfect way to just switch the gear and and keep this uh truck on the road uh so from start to finish it was pretty fun to watch and uh i i see this on a uh a future rewatch if i care to just fast forward through to see you know my favorites of the night this is one i'll stop for yeah 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 no this was a, a thing of beauty i'm gonna let our audience in on a little secret um I have been on a um, a break with SNL <laughs> since the new year. Um, I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's I I, I think it's worth mentioning because um, 
I feel like after doing this podcast for five years and just being so steeped in SNL and watching every episode multiple times in preparation, like at, at a certain point, you feel like you've said everything you can say about SNL and you've seen every trick SNL has to pull. And between that and just where culture's at, and just like I had mentioned earlier, just how kind of burnt out I, I was feeling with everything. I just, I felt like I just need to step back. And because Catherine's uh, steering the ship now, I can actually do that. I can take a little break when I need to recharge my batteries. But I turn on this episode and I see the sketch and I say, is this what I've been missing all, all season? Like, is this the caliber of work they're doing? Because this is genuinely a perfect sketch. The specificity, the, the truisms about monkey nature and how casually he communicates that, um, you know, how just like unfrozen caveman lawyer, he's, he's beholden to his, his primate nature. He can't escape that, you know, he's, he's enslaved to being a monkey. And that's um, what I thought was, that's what I thought was different about this is that he wasn't trying to, he wasn't trying to deny his nature. He was, right. his nature was fully on display. He was, yes. he's displaying ownership over the case. Yes. This is mine right. now. <laughs> this is mine now. Uh, yes, he's, he's not trying to deny it. He's, he's, he just simply is a monkey. Right. who's also a judge. He's so at ease with who he is as the monkey judge. Um, but again, that, that sophisticated, <laughs> eloquent delivery of these very prime primal instincts that he has, um, the, the genius in that and the, the caliber of the writing to bring out those specific notes, the things that we kind of all know about monkey nature, but to just have them rapid fire through his dialogue, the way that it did and just exploring it as competently as they did and having John Mulaney with just kind of his a little bit smug, self-assured delivery was just so tonally right for this character that at the end of it, I said, Oh, well, damn SNL. Like, okay. I didn't think you were going to surprise me tonight, but you, you hit the ground running with this one and darn it all. If, if I wasn't absolutely won over and, and in love with this piece. So, uh, high marks for me. I I think this was a great way to kick off tonight. Couldn't agree All more. Right. We're going to have some head nods <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll cap it there because we still got a lot of show to run through here. So after that, we get a pre-tape. An unsuspecting shopper is shamed by a slew of overbearing pet foodies. Steve, back to you. What'd you make of our first pre-tape? This is the Blue Diamond. Once again, <laughs> uh, coming through the airways from SNL. It's good to see a, a return to this subject matter. Um, a similar, but also different angle to take on it. Compared to our, the last time we saw a Cecily led blue diamond commercial. Uh, that one, uh, that first one was live. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe and, so. Yeah. Yeah. And it certainly had a very chaotic energy. It was it was more rage filled from Cecily's uh, performance, and for them to bring this back and and do something uh, uh, similar, you know, and by that I mean parody, par doing a parody of the same product. Um, uh, I like the fact that they did something that was a little more cinematic because if you can take the idea of someone being way too intense over their uh, their ideals about what you should be feeding a dog, uh, you know, having the luxury of a one camera uh, shoot, uh, it makes it, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it gives you extra beats you can do without having right. to rely on just getting the right angles on the fly during a live show. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I liked it. And uh, the performances were great. And, you know me, whenever a pre-tape starts to start to derail towards the end, which SNL skits often do, you know I'm going to love that. So, mm -hmm. you know, the constant cutting to animal after animal, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the surprise ending, uh, 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 I guess, <laughs> arousal. Yeah. <laughs> what John do I Mulaney's say? What revelation say? there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of those turns, those those ninety degree turns they take are, are crazy, and I, I love every one of them. So, uh, a sketch that held my interest and made me laugh the whole way, 
and then gave me those extra bonuses. I was, I'm, I'm just eating well as a SNL fan. Mm-hmm. How about you, Casey? What'd you think? Uh, I, I really liked it. Uh, it, it. It had a lot of SNL elements. Like it had a lot of very familiar SNL uh, touch points. Like, you know, the commercial that starts out feeling like, you know, one of these kind of integrity commercials. There was one with A.D. Bryant and uh, a paint um, a company, and I can't remember. And that's, I, I think, the perfect example of this, mm-hmm. of like, you know, the very like sophisticated uh, uh, commercial that derails in a fantastic way. And this right. is a great um, example of that. This was um, not my favorite example of that, but I was like, yeah, this is definitely you know, happening in front of my eyes and I'm, and, and it it satisfies a certain SNL flavor. I think it wasn't the best of it, but it definitely, uh, it it scratched all the right itches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's fair. (laughs) I thought this was pretty solid. Um, like you said, Casey, I, I don't think this is one for the record books, but, um, what I really enjoyed about it, aside from the, the premise itself of, obnoxious people wanting to kind of impose their values on other shoppers. Like there's just something about that. There's, there's some truth there. Those people exist. I believe they're known as Karens. Uh, someone can fact check me on that, but um, this, this felt like it was a fun starting point for the sketch. But what I really liked was that at the end of it, I wasn't saying, Oh, you know what? That was fun. They explored that idea. You know, that was, that was competent. I wasn't saying it was a good sketch. I was saying how much fun is it? that they just kept throwing you curveballs and, and finding another mode for the sketch and just kept ramping it up. And I'm, as I'm looking back on it, I'm wondering this might be where John Mulaney's presence at SNL starts to pay dividends. Cause he's not the sort of person that just comes in, shows up, figures out his blocking and delivers the show as a host, as a former writer, you get the sense that there's a little bit of his voice scattered throughout the material. Sometimes that's because people are actively trying to write for his voice, but sometimes it's because he has an opportunity to punch it up, collaborate, you know, hang out in someone's writing room and just bad ideas off the wall and make something a little bit more zany because he's had some creative input on it. And I feel like all that stuff at the end where the husband's revealing that, you know, I, I, I I think, you know, I, I think it might be working. Um, that's just such a, just a, a shameful and weird little angle to take it on at the end that I feel like there's some Mulaney in that. Um, so I just wonder, I wonder if this was a good sketch that was maybe made a little greater because, uh, they were just willing to shoot a little higher and just jam a little bit more into it. And then to your point, Steve, they wouldn't have been able to do that. If this was a live sketch, you needed to be able to get shots of, like Cecily over Heidi's shoulder talking in the dog's voice. And you needed all the the quick cuts to the different animals as they're doing the shout outs. You need all of that added camera magic and really quick editing to be able to really punctuate the jokes. And so I feel like uh, this was appropriately realized and just a lot of fun. So at this point in the show, we're two for two as far as I'm concerned. And, and I'm just really excited about where the show's going at this point. All right, up next, we get another live sketch. A group of friends attempt to have a nuanced conversation about polarizing COVID issues. Okay, Casey, what'd you make um, of this one? This was nothing new. Uh, these these sketches, I'm somebody who, who derives a great deal of comfort when Saturday Night Live is on in my vicinity. Like, it's just such a warm blanket for me that even the things that I'm like, eh, about Saturday Night Live, I still attach some sort of nostalgia to. And this is one of those kind of throwaway, all right, well, we're going to comment on, uh, on, you know, current events and we're going to, but the comment is going to be how we shouldn't be commenting on them. And, and so it's, it's well-worn territory in its conception and in its delivery. It's, you know, I, I don't like to call a sketch filler because somebody had an idea and somebody wrote that idea, but this feels a lot like just some stock SNL. Yeah, that's fair. Steve, you got anything to build on that? Well, that's, you know, points I don't disagree with. Stock is probably a good way to describe the amount of, you know, creative inspiration that's 
behind this sketch. Uh, to me, what's interesting is that it just made me realize that COVID has been s- such uh, a lengthy ordeal at this mm-hmm. point and has spanned over several seasons of this darn show uh, <laughs> that, you know, I was naive to think, you know, when they were doing the uh, from home episodes, oh, this is the the COVID uh, sure, blip. we're gonna leave this behind with those at home episodes and then get back to normal. Yeah, I thought that's what we'd be looking back on as the COVID era of SNL, mm. and uh, now we have 2020. Like, Steve was so naive, right? So now we're <laughs> creating subsections of the COVID era into smaller eras, and now we're having like, okay, now we're into this, you know, the the sunken cost fallacy stage of of dealing with this emotional process. And like the fact that we might suggest that uh, masks didn't do anything is like, no, no, we can't, we cannot even acknowledge that at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a, I think it's, you know, almost a duty of SNL, you know, as stock as this may be to, I I guess, just keep uh, contributing to what, what the conversation is. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. The conversation always circles back to COVID. Yeah. If SNL is a time capsule of culture for that week, then obviously, you know, these are the conversations that are happening. Um, So it's, it's good for SNL to pick up on that and try and find something clever to do with it. We have seen this exact sketch format with the, uh, we'll call them like the spit takes, the guffaws that then cut to like, some sort of extreme insert image. Right. Um, we, we've seen that uh, at a dinner table. I think last time they did it, it was like racial taboos that they were talking about probably sometime in the era of maybe the, the 2020 riots and, and that kind of stuff. So, but we have seen this setup. So right. like you said, Casey, this is, this is stock, um, but they're, they're repurposing that vehicle for what we're talking about this week. And I'm okay with it. Yeah. What I will say is that, I cut this sketch a lot more slack than you guys did just because I was super hot on the show coming off what I thought were a couple, you know, real strong openers. Um, so when this came around, I was just happy to embrace it for what it was. Originality, maybe not, but is it still fun to get a few good Keenan reacts? Is it fun to get <laughs> caught off guard with some bizarre inserts of like, you know, decaying animals and just like I if they can catch me off guard with a worn out vehicle then they've still succeeded in my mind. So I got enough out of this to call it a win, but you guys are right. This is, this is not the most original or groundbreaking material of the night. That's okay. Sometimes if there's a sketch that is just a conveyance for Keenan, for Keenan faces, <laughs> exactly. I'm on board. Yeah. <laughs> That's yep. all I need. Yep. <laughs> that is, that is never a bad option. Um, yeah, I think it was Brian Tucker that famously said that whenever you got a script that needs a little punching up, just write Keenan reacts into the middle of your script, and and uh, you're gonna you're gonna get Keenan doing what Keenan do. Um, <laughs> the most valuable keep, two words. Yes, Keenan react. Well, there's a reason he's been on the show for. Oh God, are we are we at eighteen years? Maybe what, what's he at now? He came in around two thousand and three. So yeah, he's. Uh, we've got a lot of Keenan reacts over the years with, for good reason. Um, (laughs) let's, uh, let's plow forward here. We get a pre-tape. The latest COVID strain is totally awesome. What do you guys make of, uh, please don't destroy his entry. Let's, uh, let's start with Steve on this one. Uh, I, I thought this was some, uh, nice appropriate escapism. Mm Mm-hmm. Who wouldn't want to think of a version of COVID that's actually going to improve your situation? And uh, such a, a simple concept and uh, ends up being a very deep well that you can draw a lot of uh, different silly things from. And mm-hmm. that's uh, that's what these guys are all about is, is escalation. And I think they really pull it off. This one was... Uh, I think what these series of shorts needed because the visual monotony of them is, uh, was starting to, you know, show itself. Mm. Yeah. You have one or two sketches that are set in the writer's room 
and it's simply like a documentary style approach, uh, you know, compared to a lot of the things that they try to do for like music videos and stuff, you know, they've spoiled their audience to the point where maybe that might not be enough, you know? Yeah. But now we've got probably by far the most production value that's ever been put into a please don't destroy video. <laughs> sure. Uh, definitely the most cameos like this was celebrity packed. There was CGI. Uh, <laughs> it was it was just crazy. But uh, I think it breathed really well is, is another point I could make. Uh, every time they were like, oh, no, something bad is happening. And then it ended up. Uh, nope, being it's good. Great. Don't worry about yeah. it. It's all good. Yeah. Like the Pokemon insurrection ends up the being them helping to sign awesome you just bills. came to pass awesome legislation <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh i think this was a very fun uh high energy sketch that uh yeah just is maintaining the high quality of of the night yeah okay what do you got casey uh these guys are a, a bit of a mystery uh to me uh or or maybe a dichotomy i don't know they're like, I want to kind of go, oh, that's so gross. It's just some gross nepotism. But the uh, they're, <laughs> they, they really pull it off. They really have their own brand. And they honed their own brand. Like, they, they put the mm. time in. Like, they're the sons of funny men who themselves became funny men, which is uh, great, which is commendable. Because, I mean, I don't think any of them really had to. Uh, so it's commendable that they did define, you know, uh, learn how to define their own style and bring it to Saturday Night Live. Like, I really like them because they feel like the playful spirit of like the ridiculous laser cat stuff that Andy Samberg and Bill Hader were doing, where it is just I, I like having that element of, hey, uh, check the dipshits are playing in the hallway again. <laughs> you know, I, I like having that element <laughs> right. in SNL because I think that it's been uh, it's been there and it's been prevalent since the beginning. So I, I think uh, please don't destroy bring bring that. And, and maybe maybe that's what I like about them. Maybe there's more things I'll find to like about them. I love the sketch. I thought it was a lot of fun because it was just a fun, silly, enthusiastic way to look at the thing that has just been killing us all slowly for years uh, and this is just mm -hmm. a fun fresh take on that and just a silly way to watch paul rudd dance for a little while and who doesn't love that <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah um yeah it took me a little while to warm up on please don't destroy um it's hard to not want to immediately compare them to what Lo lonely island used to do um and i found the editing style of this to be a little too frenetic and just a like it, it just, it, it felt like they were just doing too many cuts and it, there wasn't enough room for certain ideas to breathe in it. Maybe I'm just getting less capable of following this kind of, uh, material as I get older, like maybe I just need things to calm down, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't immediately loving the style that they were bringing to these pieces. Um, but once I got past just my feelings of how jarring some of uh, their pieces were, um, I started to have more fun with it. Once you know what to expect and you can just take it on its terms, it gets better. And I feel like this is a good showcase of what they can do, especially when they're willing to, uh, just sort of widen out a little bit and, um, try and find the next gear and the next gear and, and, you know, like just keep, keep building on top of, of the joke, even more than they normally do. Like they normally do have like a surreal quality where something in the room doesn't make sense and things are there that shouldn't be there. Or, you know, people are reacting in ways they shouldn't react. Like they have, there is an absurd surreal nature to all their pieces, but when they're willing to shoot a little bit higher and you get some cameos in the mix, I, I feel like it comes to life a bit more. And so again, maybe it's just some distance from the show gave me, you know, some, uh, some, some fresh perspective on it, but I, I felt like, I felt like I was actually enjoying please don't destroy like uh, just on their terms for the first time. So, um, I was good with it. I thought, I thought it was fun and, and all the little, uh, um, twists and turns, they, they all worked for me. Like I never saw them coming. And so they, they all landed appropriately. So win for me. Awesome. I like I like Excellent. that I can turn on my television and and still see like the joke and execution are Al Roker with a big sandwich. 
and then that's the joke. Al Roker with a big sandwich. Mm-hmm. I want that joke to be on my TV, and I'm glad that it is. <laughs> okay. Very I good. was waiting for a third sandwich. I thought they were going to do a rule of threes, because like yeah. once they brought in the second sandwich when uh, John Mulaney showed up, I was like, okay, there's got to be three lined up. At the end yeah, of but you you, you got to wonder sometimes how much stuff they shoot that just, <laughs> you know, they got to pare down for maximum impact. And sometimes you got to cut your darlings. Uh, but I mm. bet they had a lot of fun. I'm sure there's tons of outtakes, improvs and screwing around, especially if you've got Paul Rudd there. I'm sure that they were having a lot of fun making this one. And th- I think the energy was infectious. I think that might have been what helped sell it, too. Yeah. Good OK. Point. All right. So far, so good. Let's uh, let's keep moving here. The five timers discuss the need to make their club more exclusive. Okay, Casey. So we're going to jump back to your era again, where the five timers were established. Um, They've kept this joke going for a long time, and now it's becoming very self-referential. They always got to try and find a fresh take on it when they're inducting someone new. Do you think they found another way to bring back the, the club and still make it feel relevant, worthwhile? No, but I don't think that they need to make it feel relevant or worthwhile at all because it's okay. not. Good, okay. Uh, it, it's Good. a dumb joke that knows it's a dumb joke, and it's a dumb joke <laughs> that gets dumber and dumber every time Sir Paul McCartney shows up or Candace Bergen shows sure. up. It, it, you know, it, yeah. it, it's it's a joke for for the people making the joke, and that is, that's absolutely fine with me. It was weird to see in the middle of the show uh usually it's mm. part of the uh of the monologue of course you know the monologue was bound to be stand up this time but uh um it, it's a place where conan can come in and completely mess up everything he was supposed to say <laughs> make the drinky drinky uh uh thing and and it's fine it's just fine okay conan's just being conan uh i, I and that's uh again it, it's part of the thing that makes me that that draws me into the show and makes me feel like uh you know, like a part of SNL, like I'm part of the big, you know, giant New York city wide party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's all fair. And yeah, you're right. I was probably getting a little too high minded on it. You're you're right. This is just shows tradition and that, you know, you got it, you got to stick with tradition. You got to have fun with it. And, uh, yeah, even if your sketch is a hot mess, people need to see this. This is part of SNL's fabric. The friends of the show show up. It's always going to be a win. So yeah, there's a lot to take away here. What did you think, Steve? Uh, I enjoyed it. I appreciate the fact that it kind of adds to the lore of it all. If they're going to bring it back, maybe in- include a couple of new rules and uh, and and make some updates there. Mm-hmm. Because that's a, a very good point they're making with this, is that at what point does it stop being a big deal? You know, you have a show right. for nearly 50 years and oh my god suddenly a whole bunch of people just happened to accrue five uh you know times hosting so mm-hmm. the longer the show goes the no you know the, the the uh smaller of a deal it becomes you know yeah that's how uh, i feel about my wedding anniversary yeah <laughs> <laughs> Is that also how your wife feels about your wedding anniversary? Or oh. I don't know. Fortunately, she doesn't watch the podcast, so I can I can get away with a lot. Oh, that's right. awesome. Yeah. Well, that's uh, a fair point, Steve. Yeah. And I, I I thought it was funny, and I enjoy a good cameo. Uh, this is a, a such a cameo packed episode overall, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's fun to see some of the five timers who who are able to show up. And uh, yeah, Conan O'Brien screwing, screwing up his lines was definitely uh, a, a cherry on top of this Sunday. Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't seen like just a, a better way to screw up and recover than than what Conan did here. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, what when you were asking me, John, when you put me on the spot, thank you by the way. Uh, no at the That's beginning, it asked me, you know, is it you know, is it the right call to to do this little Kiev thing? Um, you know, it it sounds like they were deliberating at it as well, and this could have been the cold open. Oh yeah, I think it, it's pretty obvious that it was written to be a cold open. Um, we could, I could probably get confirmation on that if 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 I'd reached out to appropriate parties, we could have put that to bed. But yeah, I think it's pretty safe. 
No, 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 no. I think it's uh, pretty <laughs> safe to assume that that this could have been slotted into the cold open if they didn't have, uh, you know, the, the more somber approach went out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever they fill out. Yeah. Uh, but overall, I've said, yeah, I've said it all. Yeah, we don't need to dig deep on the five timers club. Um, my only thought was, I don't know if it's COVID that did it or if the show is just getting more conscious of it, but the show over the last couple seasons hasn't been as cameo heavy, uh, possibly just out of necessity because of, you know, COVID rules and whatnot. Um, and because of that, when they do a big blowout sketch like this, it feels a little more special again. At least it did to me. Um, if we were getting the sort of thing that we were getting, uh, during the Trump era where they had so many people playing recurring political characters that every cold open was 10 people at a podium or whatever. Um, you, you quickly, uh, lose that luster. So yeah, I think Jim Carrey it, put that to bed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> they they took a lot of swings with their political caricatures. Some some are more successful than others, but you get a sketch like this, and I just feel like yeah, this this feels like SNL. These aren't just people that said, well, I want to do a political. Sketch. These are genuine friends of the show from its full fifty year history. It seems like they had pretty much every decade almost covered there, um, which. It just, it, it felt good. If you're going to have cameos, I feel like this was a good use of them. And so that was my takeaway, even though it was a hot mess and it wasn't just Conan. Uh, nobody had their blocking figured out. You, yeah. uh, with these kind of things where it, it, so much of it hangs on the uh, celebrities, a lot of the celebrities are getting into town or just getting into studio for the first time on Saturday. So it hasn't been a week long process of absorbing the material and mulling it over. You're just kind of coming in cold and you just have, uh, one run through one dress rehearsal and then one live show to try and sort it all out. And I think it's pretty obvious that they don't all thrive <laughs> in that kind of last minute situation, but for what it was, I thought it was fun. I enjoyed it. I, I also want to bring up Steve Martin's uh, decision to hold the, uh, <laughs> the pipe, pipe in his hand the wrong way. Yes. <laughs> the entire <laughs> sketch. Yeah, uh, I thought that was brilliant, especially watching Candace Berg and realize what he's doing in real time. Mm -hmm. I I just want to say that just felt like such a bit that only a seasoned comedian could earn. It's not something you could do uh, unless you're yeah a comic a, a comic in his seventies who's put in a lifetime of work, <laughs> right? And just to have him grace the screen there's like not a person in the room who doesn't know who he is uh at that point in your career you could do something as stupid as hold <laughs> a pipe backwards and just you know not even like acknowledge it or make yeah. any reference to it and probably didn't even <laughs> ask about that probably like the lights were down three two one let's go that's right. probably what happened it felt like a little Ooh, you know what i could do this uh kind of decision made by Steve Martin. Right. That's why uh, it has to be made by somebody like Steve Martin, though, because that joke could not work. It could just be like, all right, he's holding his thing wrong. But mm. he's he's so entitled to laughs now. <laughs> like, it, it, it's so <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I'm Steve Martin. I do funny things that it, it can just be a thing that's just for him. And I'm quite sure it was just for him. Yeah. But that's what makes it so beautiful. <laughs> there you go. No, that's uh, that's all fair. And yeah when you come into it with so much cred and so much history with the show that people are primed and ready to laugh at whatever you're going to do, it, it just, yeah, it, I think it emboldens you to find the goofy and everything. And while well, Steve Martin's already going to find the goofy and everything. So how much more so when he knows he's, he's got a hot room and a, you know, a friendly <laughs> crowd that, that gets him at his level. Um, yeah, just makes for silliness. Uh, let's keep rolling here. Let's talk about our musical performances. LCD Sound System performs Thrills and Your City's a Sucker. Steve, well, you're not our resident musician tonight. I guess no, uh, you, you no. both could probably chime in on this. Um, but this was a very percussive, heavy performance. So I'm going to throw to you first, Steve. What would you make all this? Oh, love it. Uh, I just love a band that doesn't feel nailed down to uh, you know, a single role. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have such respect for multi-instrumentalist uh, groups that, you know, can decide what works best for their song. And then uh, they they slide over to that set of percussion or, or, or uh, you know, 
whatever other instrument they have in their repertoire. Yeah. Uh, I love LCD sound system because they, they create the right sound for, for what they're trying to do. And they constantly give me music that feels original and new, but still approachable in a big way. They do not, uh, you know, fall victim to alienation by trying to, uh, you know, pave their new path. That's so out of the way yeah. that you have to, you know, ask yourself, what is music all over again? Sure. They're not uh, so high concept that uh, they lost you. It's not their, their kid a moment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you time travel from the fifties and listen to this, you'd be like, um, <laughs> I want to go back now. <laughs> that gave me PTSD single-handedly. Uh, yeah. It's, it's definitely a indication of, of huge evolution in music over the years. And it's great that we're at a point in, uh, in musical history that, you know, this is a band that can be successful and, and have an, a, a wide audience. Yeah. They're, they're, they're amazing, but I really, you, like you said, I, I've been demoted for the night because Casey sure. is the real expert. Yeah. Leave some, leave some scraps on the table here. Okay. Casey, <laughs> what, what did you make all this? Um, I, th- this, this episode was basically tailor made for me. I'm a, 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 I've been a huge Mulaney fan ever since, you know, ever since SNL, uh, and <laughs> and been a huge, uh, uh, been a huge LCD sa- sound system fan ever since I came back from Coachella one year, having never heard of them, and then heard them when I got back and found out they were there and that I missed them and I hate myself for it. Uh, but wow, the, uh, their their last album was decent. It had some cool stuff on it. It had some really cool stuff on it. But it, it's not an album I pick up. Uh, it's not an album that has a strong enough through line for me. This new stuff, man, it, it, it's th- there's like a new energy. I love that they're a band that they don't have to do. You know, they can make a song like I Can Change or like something that's got a real, real solid pop aesthetic. But then they can uh, and they can ride that unapologetically into some some of that real David Byrne world music mm. kind of uh, feeling stuff that that makes a, a song drag on to for 14 minutes when maybe it didn't need to. But I'm kind of still entranced by the counter rhythms. That's very much what this band is. And, and to hear that enthusiasm come back um, from an album may, and it may have been there in that album. It just didn't reach me. But man this new stuff is cool as hell okay. cool yeah well i thought i was going to be clever and make a david byrne reference and and sound like i know what i'm talking about when it comes to music but you you uh you trampled I'm that sorry. casey <laughs> so uh my only my only other note on it was uh during the first song <laughs> thrills i don't think the live mix was that great because that distorted sample that um the Asian lady was doing on the Moog there. That was so forward in the mix and drowning out so much that um, it it could maybe it was just because I was listening with my headphones. I don't know, but there was something about the mix that was uh, making the first song a little grating. So as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking like this is interesting. Like I'm enjoying what this could be. I bet the studio mix of this is phenomenal, and now I want to go out and experience that and see. You know, if without just the abrasiveness of a mix that I think was just not working great in the the SNL studio space, um, you know, if there's more to explore with that song, because I, I think there is. It was it was definitely interesting, and uh, I do like them as as uh, I don't know, just bringing something that I don't cross paths with as often as maybe you guys do. So uh, this was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. I would like to actually hear it the way that they intended it. So uh, I'm going to be seeking that out. I guess that's my my final word on it. Let's take a look at Weekend Update. For their lead-in, Jost and Che discuss the Russian invasion of Ukraine and Biden's selection of a Supreme Court nominee. Steve, what do you think of this week's opening salvo? I thought it was pretty good. You know, uh, it's not the easiest week to be making jokes with the current news cycle. So you Mm got to give them credit for that. Uh, You know, I thought it was great. a uh, great comparison to the to the Olympics. There, it was such a great dig to that. Uh, yeah, it was uh, a rare occurrence to see 
uh, we can update, not have any features and just have jokes all the way through. So, uh, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, I think gives us more time to appreciate what uh, weekend update is, you know, what it is at its core. And it's right. just, you know, delivering one liners and, and good jokes. And, uh, yeah, did the spades, you know, we had what penis batteries and, uh, you know, even Trump jokes are getting in there. So, uh, there, there was a lot going on and, uh, you know, Che got to be Che, uh, Joe's got to be Joe's. I felt like this was, uh, a very, uh, very competent and very, uh, I don't want to say typical, but it's very, you know, of the caliber that we've come to expect from this Joe and Shea era and, uh, and things with a yo mama joke. Come on. Like <laughs> they've left us with nothing to ask for. It's perfect. Very good. Yeah. Casey. Um, I thought it was fine. Uh, it, nothing to write home about. Uh, I'd like to know what we missed out on. Um, because uh, at the very end, Joe, uh, Colin Joe makes a joke. Um, saying that ends this uh, another edition of uh, oops all jokes which uh, leads me to believe maybe <laughs> there was something that uh, that a uh, feature that was supposed to happen but yeah the jokes were fine the, the their chemistry was great as always they can be half asleep or half dead and their chemistry is always going to be great uh, so it, it, it was something to watch but it wasn't uh, you, you know I mean it was it was the news that felt conspicuously short uh, but it was still the news Yep. I didn't mind it. Uh, and I kind of like weekend update sometimes when it is reined in a little bit, right? Weekend update can become a big sprawling piece of the show. And sometimes that means nixing some other sketch material. Um, obviously they knew they were going to need some runway for the, the post update extravaganza they were going to be doing. Uh, so they, I think they intentionally made sure that they were a little more modest this week, but I don't mind it. I, I don't need them to dig deep. Just give us your a material, get in, get out quick. And, uh, you know, let's have some fun. But, um, this, this to me, I, I felt was perfectly appropriate. Um, it, it is weird without a feature, but Honestly, I didn't miss it. I was I was ready to move on because we all know what happens in the back half of, of a Mulaney show. And I think they knew that everyone was waiting for that too. So why prolong the inevitable? So with that said, why prolong the inevitable? Let's uh, get into this uh, obligatory musical extravaganza. A naive, churro-craving New Yorker gets a whimsical musical wake-up call from the denizens of the subway. Casey, theatrics, sets, New York inside jokes. This is what we expect from Mulaney. Did you want a fifth outing? Uh, <laughs> yes and no, I guess. Did I want one? No, because the, like I don't find myself laughing at these anymore. Mm. Uh, I, I laughed at the spectacle of the first one. The first one is very, uh, uh, very beautifully executed. Uh, uh, and... And honestly, that this kind of benefits from the same kind of inside joke. Like, yeah, we're SNL. We do big bloated things, and we make you sit through them <laughs> for ten minutes. Uh, and part of that part of that is why it's so funny. And and the fact that they can spend so much money on a sketch like this that that on its face is like, <laughs> cut it out. Stop doing this sketch. It's over. Uh, it is part of what what makes me just uh, enjoy it so much to, you know, to see the next little set piece that they cart out and go see. We didn't need to do this, but uh, mm -hmm. that's that's definitely part of the charm. Yeah. Steve, hot take. Uh, <laughs> well, the, uh, the 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 post has just kept moving. Uh, every time they do one of these, you know, after the first one, we're asking the next time he hosts, will we see another version of this? Then we saw that. And then we got to the trilogy and we're like, are we going to cut it off there? Call it three. And then, you know, a fourth and a fifth. And now at this point, it would be weird not to do one almost. And if they're starting to show their age and becoming a little bit stale. <laughs> And you're in a position where like people expect you to do another one. Uh, I, I don't think you can win in that scenario. Every uh, you either awkwardly bow out or you 
deliver something that's uh, going to make you say, oh, I like diner lobster better. Uh, so, yeah, we're if we're not already there, you know, we've at least been moving towards that. And uh, it's always going to be a great source of sets and costumes and, uh, you know, showcasing the vocal talents of our cast. Uh, so it's always going to have things to enjoy. Uh, I guess, it, you know, New York is a, a big place, so there's going to be a lot of things to uh, pick apart and, uh, you know, uh, explore the minutia of weird, uniquely New York things. Yeah. Uh, SNL does paint itself into a corner sometimes when they allow themselves to set expectations that, fulfill fan expectations but at a certain point if the creative well is running dry are you creating the best content you could by forcing yourself to have to revisit what's come before and stick with tradition uh it, it's always tricky but snl wouldn't be snl if they didn't drive recurring sketches into the ground like that <laughs> that is kind of snl's thing in in so many ways and it is part of the charm People do tune in because they're hoping they're going to get another outing with that, you know, whatever it is that catches the cultural zeitgeist that people are talking about. They want to know if they're going to do it again the next week. And that gets people to tune in. So if they didn't do it and if they didn't give people water cooler talk, it wouldn't SNL is not doing its job. So I, I'm, I'm of two minds because I feel like there's value in, in having, um, like traditions that certain hosts go back to when they come. And and we've seen that like with Justin Timberlake, you know, he he'll, he'll have another outing with the lonely Island and, and they'll do like another mother lovers or whatever. Like they'll do a run of those um, or other friends of the show hosts. They'll revisit what was a big hit from their previous outing. So this is the show's DNA. They have to do it. But at the same time, I wish they'd never done the second one. I was happy that the second one held the bar high production wise and that, you know, they still found fun, fresh musical things to goof on. Um, I like the sketch for the, the production value of it and the, just the ambitiousness of it. But in hindsight, I wish they hadn't done it and just kind of pulled the bandaid off with Mulaney's second time hosting and said, no, Mulaney is such a wealth of creative ideas and we can have so much fun with this guy we're not going to just do the same thing over for fan service. We're going to give you something fresh. Uh, I wish that that was the decision that had been made back then because it wasn't now it's inevitable, inevitable. And so now all I'm doing is looking at it and saying, okay, are they keeping the bar high? Are they, are they like lyrically, are they mining show tunes for something fun and, and uh, amusing to me? And I feel like it ticked all the boxes that these have to tick. It just in my mind, I just don't think it needs to exist. Uh, that said, they did Skid Row from Little Shop, which is one of my favorite musicals of all time. And so, uh, you know, I, I got to say, you know, I was grinning and, and just really, really jazzed with some of their choices on this one. And, you know, 80 as Subway Jesus, there, there's, <laughs> there, there, there's still so much good stuff that they find that it's hard to be too sour on it. Oh, yeah. uh, and Melanie's saying, can you even do so specific anymore? Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's fun. it's now turning inward a little bit too in some regards. So um I want something fresh from Melanie. He did his five timer stint. If ever they had another another opportunity to put it to bed, this would be it. Right. Like, let's cap it here. We did our first five. He's got like a whole other year or two to figure out something else from the vault that he wants to bring back. Let's let's do something new next time. This one I'm okay with, I guess. That's where I'll yeah, Tom Hanks doesn't do Mr. Short-Term Memory anymore. Yeah, yeah. But there's just as many cases where we could show them going back to recurring characters way more times than is necessary. So oh, well, it's uh, become, you know, it it's both become ways. that's the second life of a sketch now, is when it's been done so many times that when it comes on, you groan and go, oh, right. stop for doing <laughs> yeah. this again. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, we got a groan out of you anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If Reese what gives you nothing else, he'll give you a groan. Yeah. Exactly. I just wanted to mention one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It was interesting that Pete Davidson wasn't uh, there right. for the night because he's often the 
uh, character that uh, Andrew Dismukes is stepping right, in right. to do. Now, uh, he uh, he doesn't do a whole lot for it. You know, he's mostly just there to take it all in, but he's still on the cast. And, you know, we've seen regular sketches where people, like, for example, you know, when Will Forte left the cast, uh, you know, Taron Killam started putting on the glasses and, and being the announcer for what's up with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've seen that before, but it's interesting when you're still on the cast and somebody is now uh, filling in for your recurring role. Uh, I guess he's keeping people safe from Kanye by not being in uh, in the building. But uh, <laughs> if I did more research, I'd probably know what he was up to and why he wasn't uh, what, there that night. But I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's off shooting something, but I would have expected him to fly home for Mulaney's outing. Cause yeah, especially little, for Mulaney knowing how close they yeah. are. Right. Yeah. So the inside baseball is when Pete was going through a rough patch a few years ago, Mulaney was kind of his mentor because yeah. he understood, you know, some, some of those same issues that Pete struggles with. So they did some touring together. Uh, I think they, I think they toured with Judd Apatow for a little while. And, and it was just like, it was just like touring therapy for Pete and Mulaney was just like this big brother figure. And yep. and it was like how, how wholesome and wonderful that, that, that community could kind of rise to the occasion for Pete. And, uh, I just, I did not expect uh, a Mulaney outing where Pete wasn't in the building, but Hey, it, it is what it is. He could be like, you know, in Australia somewhere shooting something and there's <laughs> yeah. just no way I, you know, you don't, you don't know what, what the constraints are, but I was surprised for what it's worth. Yeah. They, they, I did, guess Pete, uh, they did a feature on uh, update uh, years ago uh, about the mentorship. Yes, uh, and, and Mulaney was there, right? Like they tag yeah, team it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. M- Mulaney like showed up on the thing. So I was like, oh great, they're gonna do a thing now where uh, Pete Davidson's gonna mentor sure. uh, uh, Mulaney. That that'll be right. the the joke, and uh, it was yeah, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, I, yep. you know, uh, Clint Eastwood has another movie out that they could totally <laughs> harp yeah, on. Yeah, right. Sure, it's, yeah, yeah. It's all synergy. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, well, what could have been? But what we got next, hey, how do you like that for a segue, is a live sketch. Behind the Slime takes a look at Nickelodeon's You Can't Do That on Television and its iconic green goo. All right, it is Canada Night on the SNL After Party podcast. Uh, I feel like this sketch should have a, a warm place in all of our hearts. Casey, uh what do you make of this one? How, how did it land for you? Uh, this was kind of a zero for me. Uh, okay. uh, it, 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 the, the slime subculture thing. I was very into it. I love slime stuff like that. Uh, but we didn't have like the show. Uh, I grew up in r- very rural Ontario, so we didn't have that show. So I didn't really, I mean, I knew of it, but it wasn't like, like near and dear to my heart kind of thing. So mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, I don't really, I don't know if like the consistency of slime is, is, uh, a great premise that that I miss because you know uh, I missed out on the cultural phenomenon. But yeah, I did. I, I thought this was just kind of de- dead in the water. Okay, I was I was hoping for some some brilliant insights on eighties children's cable TV fair, but uh, maybe Steve, Steve, wh- are you uh, uh, you can't do that on television, kid, or are you kind of coming I, into this cold? No, I was. Uh... Uh, at least more than Casey from the sounds of it. Uh, I I remember watching this and, you know, watching this sketch made me realize that this might be one of my earliest uh, exposures with sketch comedy. Mm. So yeah, I guess it uh, should hold a a special place in my heart for that reason. But yeah, I loved it. You know, uh, Barth uh, or Garth or who was the, uh, the restaurant owner? Yeah, it was Barth, wasn't it? Barth, Barth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's yeah, there's all these recurring characters and stuff there that just pops in my mind randomly. So it definitely uh, imprinted onto my brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I've I've seen it enough to for that to happen. I remember it fondly, and of course, slime is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, Casey, I also grew up in very very rural Ontario. And as such, we had one television station on a good day. Uh, So I was not (laughs) exposed to this on a regular basis, but I do remember 
the rare occasion that we we went in to visit family in in a city and they had like cable television. Uh, and so it, it would just be a nonstop run of children's fair that was just so loud and neon and <laughs> just like mind blowing to someone that's, that's so like, um, um, uh, m- media, uh, averse, like you just don't get that same kind of like level of television as crack cocaine for kids, um, when you live in the country. So I remember seeing this show probably in the late eighties and, uh, just being absolutely just blown away by the, the insanity of, Oh, they're dropping like how it's just so much fun to, to see that happen. Um, at that age, I guess. So, um, I really just like the nostalgia trip of this as a sketch. I think you're right, Casey, like there's not a whole lot to hang your hat on here, but I just, anytime that the show touches on something that I feel like is uniquely taps into one of my youthful experiences, uh, I just can't help but uh, be won over by it. So just purely for the the nostalgia bait part of it, uh, I I was enjoying this. And again, it's a hot night. And if if uh, I'm enjoying the show as a whole, I'll take these kind of pieces and just get as much out of them as I can. So yeah. for that, I enjoyed it. You know what sums it up is that, you know, it's it's all the gags of, of the sliming done on set and actually uh, soiling the cast members. Right. That's that's the gag that acts as the Trojan horse to the real premise of the sketch, which is to showcase how poorly some uh, television has aged. Well, yes, yeah, no, they. It, it is nice that they found uh, a, a, a another way to make it more than just goofing on the consistency of the goo, right? Like they they peppered it with little quizzical things that you need to think about for a minute and start to mm-hmm. think about, like, oh. I, really in a kid's show, but yeah, it was a different time. And I'm sure that there's a lot of stuff genuinely in the show that probably yeah. didn't age any better than the jokes that they, that they were coming up with. So, uh, right. yeah, there, there was some fun to be had there too. Yeah. And then the added bonus of, uh, Chris red, absolutely making a meal of, uh, losing his mustache. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm assuming that that's whole intention. Yeah, so I'm assuming that was a, a prop malfunction. I, I don't think that that was something they were going for. No, no, but he yeah. he instead of just like grabbing it and hiding it, you know, he really just uh, <laughs> yeah added some finesse to it and kind of made it part of the performance. Right. He made yeah, a this joke was about a, his hair falling out. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this whole sketch, it was it was a bit of a mess in a few ways. Um, Chloe Feynman lost it. I think the goo splattered on her more than she was expecting or something because she was balled over there at one point and she was in frame. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, slime, it makes everything just a little more chaotic. And uh, <laughs> I think they were, at least in the house, I think they were having a lot of fun with it, knowing that this is not serious fair. We're getting near the end of the show. Who cares if it's a bit of a hot mess? Um, yeah, the slime sold it. it. Worked for me. Let's take a look at our 10 to 1. A oh, newly God. married husband is surprisingly at ease doing the Cupid shuffle at his wife's family reunion. Uh, Casey, a- another sketch that uh, came back from a previous Mulaney outing. Um, what'd you make of this one? I loved it the first time they did it. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, I found it to be such an endearing sketch and he sold it so beautifully. Uh, and this was a retread of that. This was diminishing returns, but he's still selling it. He st- he sells it with so much precision. He does the actual dance, and he doesn't um, mock the dance at all. He fully commits mm-hmm. and believes what he's doing. And so something that is essentially just kind of a, a, a rewarmed version of the first time they did it, uh, it, 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 it still held uh, held its original charm for me. Yeah, he has to do the dance as though it's second nature, as though it's totally effortless to him because it feeds into the idea that his character is just surprisingly cool. Like yeah. he just he just knows how to get along in any situation. And that's that's the charming thing. Like to watch what you think is going to be a fish out of water situation or there's going to be like you know some sort of like racial angle to him not fitting in with her family and no it's you you know he's just he's got it covered he's he knows everyone's names he's got history he's got you know like anecdotes Uh, it's it's charming to yeah to see him be so 
comfortable in his own skin in a situation where the easy writing would suggest, oh, make something where the person is the odd man out. Um, and it's it's interesting because it, it's uh, on its face it doesn't make sense. It, it, it's it's a sketch that doesn't right. hold water at all if you think mm-hmm. about it for for five seconds. But so it really does have to be the showcase of him doing the dance in that right. very nonchalant but still very precise way. Right. Okay, Steve, you got anything you want to mop up on this one, or do we get it all? Uh, that's mostly it. Uh, if you want to. Uh you know, get some extra meat out of this sketch. Just pay attention to the extras. I feel like everybody was, you know, uh, properly vetted to, to, uh, you know, take on this role. It felt like there was some extra effort put into this than there usually is for casting their extras, especially you you compared to like the courtroom sketch where they're just expected to sit there and listen. Now, you, you know, you got some very lively people and they all like, they all really just made it their own. And there's some real characters going on in the background there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Almost everybody on screen is worth watching just like the whole time. (laughs) Well, they knew they were already bringing in trained dancers for the, the show tunes blowout sketch. So what's, what's a few more for the cha-cha slide or the Cupid shuffle. Yeah. Um, They get a, they get a bulk discount (laughs) and they were just that uh, close to the cutoff. Yeah. So, uh, in the final equation, I think we round out the night with something that, like you said, Gracie, uh, that you said, Casey, isn't breaking any new ground, but sold purely on Melania's ability to just make that character just infectiously watchable. Uh, that's that's where I was landing on it. So as as much as I didn't need to see this, the same as I didn't need to see another musical outing, uh, I was surprised by the end of the show just just how happy I was with what Mulaney was able to turn in on his fifth outing at a time when we just didn't know if he was, you know, back, back at full speed. Um, so yeah, that's how we round out the night. We want to, we want to get into our ratings and reviews. Okay. Okay. Steve moment of the night. Ooh, moment of the night. You know, you could go with like, uh, the more somber moment, maybe when the camera tilts and you see that it actually spells Kiev on the, uh, on the, on the candles. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you want to go for a comedian, c- comedic one, you know, you have some great visual gags, uh, from the COVID conversation sketch. I mean, what I keep thinking about is that little elevator that they built for Kate's head. <laughs> um, and if not for that, then it's another great costume uh, move for Kate uh, when she played the puddle. There's, mm. uh, you know, there's so much. But if I had to choose, uh, I think I, I think I want to give it to to John Mulaney for making a uh, a joke <laughs> about Dan Aykroyd vodka. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was that was pretty. It's, classic. it's not the Tracy. It's not the Tracy Morgan. What is it? Aquarium water? That's, yeah, uh, that's yeah, his that's tonic water. It's the Dan Aykroyd vodka. <laughs> Which, fun fact, since we're it's Canadian night on the SNL podcast, um, made in Chatham, Ontario, about like, I don't know, half an hour down the road from where I'm at. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, and, and Dan Aykroyd hails from Ottawa and is often kicking around these parts. Um, he's actually a surprisingly easy guy to track down if if ever anyone wanted to talk to him, he is, you know, he's, he's just kind of living his life out here in Ontario these days. Uh, okay. so, you know, for, for what it's worth, uh, Dan Aykroyd vodka, it's made, uh, it's made in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and John Mulaney is an admitted fan. Yes. Um, okay. So, uh, we, we got, we got a moment of the night from you. How about you, Casey? Uh, moment of the night. That's difficult. Uh, I almost want to say Conan doing the drinky drinky because again, it's something that, uh, that I I love that the, as a comedy fan, I'm on the outside looking in the window and I love that the kind of brotherhood of comedy. And I love seeing, seeing that I love seeing it be so low stakes for these incredibly rich incredibly successful talented people who have nothing to prove they can stand on the stage at snl and completely flub a line and just be like i don't care i'm very rich uh (laughs) and and there's that kind of like flippant malaise that i enjoy so much uh on that stage specifically so i want to say that 
there's a line though in the musical when uh, A.D. Bryant's uh, Beer Hat Jesus comes out. Uh, and uh, hold on, let me see if I can find the line. Um, uh, yes, he says, uh, uh, Jesus Christ wearing Crocs. Why does she have a spider in a box? <laughs> <laughs> and man, I was like, yep, that got me. So I think that line might be my uh, moment of the night. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I'm going to give it to the moment in Mulaney's monologue where he reassured me that he hasn't missed a beat. He uh, he brings his whole first story back around. Here's the stinger. I turned an innocent man into a drug dealer as opposed to drug dealers turning innocent people into drug addicts. Um, what a just fun notion to tack down in your mind and craft a whole piece around and then have such a, just a, an elegant way to put a bow on it. It just said to me, Oh, look, John Mulaney, he's John Mulaney. He's still John Mulaney. He's still doing his thing and uh, I'm eating it up. That's what set the night off right for me. And uh, it didn't disappoint from thereafter. So uh, that's gotta be my moment. Yeah, he he puts his thesis on the end of his jokes at times. Yeah, uh, you know, which is quite the opposite of what a lot of comics do. Sometimes they'll give you that, you know, elevator pitch version of their joke, and then expand. But to like guide your audience to that, uh, to that one line that sums it all up, and make them say, "Huh, yeah, everything you just told me basically <laughs> supports that uh, that notion." Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, that's that's classic Mulaney right there. Yeah, it's just well crafted stand up. It just shows that he's on top of his game, and uh, I like it when I see it. Now, best sketch, Casey. What do you got? Uh, Monkey Judge. Yeah, hands down, Monkey Fair Judge enough. is the best sketch. It it had everything. It was perfectly executed. Best sketch. Yep. What do you got, Steve? Uh, that is hard to uh, go against. You know, uh, this was the most fun, the most cleverly written. And uh, yeah, it was just a perfect vehicle to uh, to cater to John Mulaney's style of line delivery. I can't think of a better uh, character for, for this host to play. Absolutely. Everybody yep. involved was great too. So yeah, you got to love this. Yeah, no, it was an excellent sketch. Great idea, perfectly realized. And uh, beautiful performances all around. And Mulaney just, yeah, he struck the exact right tone for that character. It is my best sketch as well. There's no contest. Uh, that is one that people will revisit. Like that, that's, that is a, a high watermark, I think, maybe for this season. It's certainly one of the best. Um, but we don't need to dwell on it. Let's uh, talk about our MVP. Uh, Steve, what do you got? MVP, you know what I'm going to say. It's John Mulaney. <laughs> uh, he is like a very highly magnetic force and, you know, he, he goes into the metallic fluid pool that is, uh, SNL and they just start dancing. You know, that there is definitely a gravitational pull to that man in, in this setting. Mm -hmm. And this whole show just seems to form around him and you get one of the most undeniably, uh, uh, signature styles of an SNL episode for all the things that are similar from week to week. There's so much here. That's just, you know, you would only expect from a Mulaney episode and yeah. What, what are you going to do? Pick someone else. I dare you go ahead. <laughs> right, you Casey, next. I dare you. What do you got? <laughs> uh, I, I am just going to buckle under the pressure, uh, but it is <laughs> sure you were. <laughs> It's absolutely Bellini. I mean, it, he brings, he's one of those people, he's like Odenkirk to me, or Conan. You know, mm -hmm. he's one of those people who's so much, there's so much Saturday Night Live in their DNA. You can you can feel so much SNL coming off of them, and it makes you love them. It like, it, it, it gives you, it's just like you said, that gravitational pull. It, it, it's, it, it, but at the same time, they are absolutely their own definable brand, their own definable type of uh, uh, of comedy and of what they do. Uh, mm -hmm. And Mulaney brought that in full force to this episode. Like he brought, he swept in 
with his, you know, nonchalant, like, eh, whatever. I'm one of the funniest people. I'm one of the best voices of comedy. Uh, and, and he brought that and he just allows you. But he 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 brings you in to experience that. He doesn't just show you the, you know, like that. Like there are, are comedians who are very closed off. They're very, I'm very funny. I'm, I'm in this little glass case. Uh, uh, you know, I'm unapproachable. I feel like his thing is very approachable. And and it makes him all the more endearing. Okay. Boom. Yeah. Very now, good. I think there could be a case to be made for Keenan and Cecily. I think they both did some great I was work gonna tonight. say Cecily, but yeah, it's Mulaney. But yeah, you guys are right. And uh, there's no way to not land on Mulaney. Um there's a fun documentary. I can't remember if it was uh James Franco's or a different one, but there was a little peek in on Mulaney and Hader, I think just on writer's night, like working overnight in a little box office on the 17th floor. And I remember just being awestruck at how easily they could play off each other and build on each other's ideas and pull in so much, um, like cultural or media references. It's like they'd seen every movie ever made, every musical ever made. And it, it just like, it informed their ability to on the fly in the moment, lob each other brilliant little things to bat around and, and explore and build on. And I just remember thinking, Oh, you know what? That's, that's what makes these sketches. It's not just someone toiling away in, in front of their computer, like a single minded approach. It's when you get people that can just collaborate and energize each other and bring the best out of each other and find those fun little ideas and just goof on it till it turns into something. And I have no reason to assume that I know what goes on on the 17th floor when Mulaney's there, but I feel like he must still want to be there on writer's night just to give as much of his magic to the show as he can. Yes. And I think that's why you get so much specificity in these, these sketches and just so much that capitalizes on his presence and his voice. I think it's because he wants to be there and he's making sure he's inserted into that process and giving everyone what he can. I think he's very generous that way. Um, and so because of that, you can't make an argument for anyone else. When Mulaney's there, unless the show is like a total stinker for some reason, and he's never turned in a bad show, there's just no one else you can go with. So, uh, yeah, Mulaney for me too. All right, big question, guys. On a scale of classic, great, decent, weak, or train wreck, how would you rate this episode? Casey? Great. Beautiful. Great well episode. It, it could be a classic, but it didn't have, I don't think it had a definitive classic sketch. Monkey Judge is gorgeous comedy, and uh, I will revisit it, but... But yeah, I feel comfortable with great. Okay, Steve? Yeah, great sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Does good sound great? Stay tuned. Uh, I think that's appropriate. I was uh, looking for a reason to just let me bump it up, but I don't think there's anything that stands out. Um, you know, we're... we're Still in the COVID area, like I said, uh, you know, and and all that stuff I said about this being a new sub era of COVID. Uh, yeah, that would be like the strongest argument I would have to to saying that this is culturally relevant enough to get that extra stamp of classic approval. Uh, it it it's just not enough to merit that. So we is too weak an argument. So uh, great is I think where this should be. And, uh, yeah, you know how rare it is to get a classic out of any of us that, that do this show. So, hey, man, it's like, it's like a Michelin star, right? You know, if your restaurant gets one, even just one, you're, you're, you're still going to be proud of it. Sure. I think Mulaney is a classic host. And I mean, he's a five timer now. Like, I, I think, I think the world agrees that. Mulaney is is in the pantheon of, of great hosts now. Um, but that said, the thing that keeps this from being great is that they didn't break new ground. 
his first outing could be qualified as classic because you just you saw so much stuff that you just don't see week over week on SNL that he was really responsible for crafting, like Diner Lobster or uh, uh, the, the the TV show from the eighties. Oh my room. god, that is a gorgeous <laughs> sketch. That's Isn't I think it? my favorite sketch from that from that episode. Yeah, and the fact that the, and, the little boy in the sitcom is Andy Cunanan. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yes. that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff, when you, when you, when you get it for the first time and it just really hits you, um, th- that makes for a classic episode tonight was Mulaney's greatest hits. It was just yeah. kind of welcome back Mulaney and a greatest hit show just isn't enough to get it over the top, but it was the most even Mulaney show. And it, yeah. you know, he was in top form. So there was so much to like about this, but it, it didn't break new ground. And for that, yeah. It can only be great. So I think we're all in lockstep on this, guys. I don't remember what we gave John Mulaney's first episode, but I just realized sometimes, you know, uh, episodes can retroactively earn a classic rating, you know, five. uh, Once you see where it actually ends up in our cultural fabric. Yeah. So do do you think if you didn't give the first one a classic, it's a classic now? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think... For for what uh, you know, what kind of stamp, and and the sheer frequency of him hosting, you know, right. it, it's it's reminiscent of like the 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 Bucks and the uh, the Carlins and and the people that just hosted right. uh, like almost a couple of times per season. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe not the Carlins, yeah. but the Buck well, Henrys for sure. Yeah. 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 I I spaced on examples, but they're out there. <laughs> well, uh, there's Steve Martin. <laughs> that one could have come to mind. Shut up. There's Alec Baldwin. Okay, I know some. Uh, but yeah, if if we could look back and, and know that was the start of something like that, uh, right. that would definitely be where we would put a, a classic if we're talking about Mulaney episodes only. Right. You. It wasn't necessarily obvious that he planted his flag on that first episode and he was going to be you know, the next go-to guy for the show to mine as like a five-timer especially in the course of like five years. That's, that is a feat. So uh, yeah, no, that's all, all well put. Casey, do you have any other final brilliant thoughts on this show that you just, you want our audience to mull over? Uh, No, I try not to have brilliant thoughts about the show uh, because it's one of those things for me that I, I, I refuse to let it, become anything other than a joy. I know a lot about, uh, you know, about SNL. I read uh, Tom Shale's book and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I do need to know those things. I, I do need to know the little behind the scenes. I, I need to know how much Coke was being done, uh, uh, you know, and in, and in whose office. Uh, but, uh, but I'll never let it be uh, anything other than an absolute joy. So I don't watch the show with my little critics hat on. Uh, I watch it with my little ten year old dork uh, comedy dork hat on, uh, and and it works every time. Wonderful. <laughs> I wonder what that. I just like. said a billion words to say absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you this... conveyed your enduring love of the show, and that's all you needed. I think that's what I was trying to say. Yeah. You no, I think well that's here. a. I, I think uh, we'll give you the final word on that, Casey. I think that's a, a great place to leave it tonight. But before we go, um, we need to like get the word out about what you're up to, where people can find you. If anyone wants to collab, what uh, what would you like people to know about, you know, where they can find your stuff online or learn more about you? Uh, well, you can find uh, my stuff. I do a lot of uh, themes for um for podcasts and things like that, I actually did the uh, the theme for Jamie Dew's uh, um, uh, Saturday Night Live podcast. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So check me out at CaseyLinesProductions.com. That's my uh, uh, official site. Otherwise, CLP Beats on Twitter. Uh, but that's just a lot of inane jokes that didn't need to be made. That's my whole uh, <laughs> mo. Those are some Twitter. of my favorite jokes on Twitter. I'll have you know. <laughs> the, the the horribly inane ones <laughs> yes <laughs> very good all right well gentlemen i am so glad that after as many years as as i've been batting this around like with steve always trying to just make sure that it, you were always somewhere on our, our radar on our back burner for when we could make this happen i'm just i'm glad that it finally did it's a shame that you know it, it 
Catherine had to be offed in order to make this happen. But I, I think. Oh uh, God! Did you, you know, kill someone? You do what you got to do. She Look, she was I'm a hard, honored. she was I'm she was a hard that... pass on Casey, so we had to part ways. Look, we, I understand. We took care of her. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. all we'll say on the matter. But in, in all seriousness, Catherine will be back uh, very, very soon. I'm assuming next week. Uh, she's just tending to family business, traveling, doing something. I don't know. I don't pry, but uh, uh, she's she's going to be back to cover who we got. We got Oscar Isaac next week, right? Yeah, I believe right. so. Moving yes. And Charlie himself. XCX is the musical guest. So uh, for all the Catherine fans out there, she is still part of the show. Uh, you won't have to endure another John hosted episode for the foreseeable future. Um, so hopefully that's uh, that's good news. And uh, with that, I think we'll call it a night. Thanks to Steve Finn and Casey Lyons. And thanks as well to our most generous patrons, Neil Weinstein, Justin Gardner, Grace Kogan, and Brian Clark. If you're enjoying our show, please subscribe on YouTube or wherever better podcasts can be found. Your subscription helps us grow and your support is greatly appreciated. We'll be back in one week when SNL returns with host Oscar Isaac and musical guest Charlie XCX. But until then, this has been episode number 154 of the Saturday Night Live After Party Podcast. I'm John Murray. Good night. Have a pleasant tomorrow.